Hello, hello, and this is the Sleon Productions podcast, where we interview entrepreneurs, authors, and change makers, history makers that go out and influence other people and other people's lives. Uh, today, we have a guest, um, a author of the book, Restoring the Shattered, Illustrating Christ's Love Through the Church in One Accord, Hansi E. Head. She is a author. Uh, Nancy, welcome to the Sling Out Productions podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Appreciate it. Nancy, can you tell the audience a little bit about yourself? Well, I am the mother of five children, and during most of the years they were growing up, I was by myself, and they've now grown up and married. I have 10 grandchildren, and as we speak, I am awaiting the second great-grandchild. So I spent uh, 11 years as a single mother, and during that time, friends encouraged me through some very lean days. And I went back to school, got a degree at Penn State, uh, found a job uh, in radio, which was very enlightening and interesting and uh, just uh, the kind of job that um, really raises your passions, uh, news radio for for doing local news. I hadn't really been as interested in local before, but, um, you know, showing the example of my kids to uh, find a, a job and work and support ourselves and become independent financially. And we did that through uh, a lot of encouragement and help that people in the community gave us, people in our church. And that really made a difference. So I really want to bring this message that um, communities can lift people up out of poverty. And can you tell us your journey of how you got this book out? Well, the book came about because... I realized that so many Christians misunderstand other Christians. And we have these oftentimes distortions, sometimes authentic disagreements. But even in the authentic disagreements, there's a lot of misunderstanding about why we disagree. And I look around my city and I see 36 pastors who meet at 6.30 a.m. every Sunday and praying for each other not necessarily che checking doctrine at the door, um, helping each other out, encouraging each other, and praying for our city. And I see the difference that's happening with ministries move into the low income town, uh, the low income neighborhoods. There's a, a food pantry across town next to a Catholic church. There's a shoe ministry uh, next uh, within a Methodist church, and at my church, non denominational. We collect peanut butter in March for the food pantry. We collect shoes in July or August for the shoe ministry. It gives shoes to low-income kids, 18 years old and younger. They get a free pair of shoes and two free pairs of socks twice a year. And just trying to invite the community to come around these ministries to that are making a difference for people, really helping each other. Inviting individuals to find someone in their neighborhood, in their town, somehow connected, you know, through their church, perhaps encouraging that person to lift that person up, helping that person find financial independence, and then encouraging that person to become someone who lifts other people up. One thing that I really, really liked about your book that you talk about being independent uh, from being uh, dependent on other people. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, there were times when people were dropping boxes of food off on our doorstep, um, a knock on the front door, and there's a Christmas card with a check in it to help out with our Christmases. Uh, a Sunday school class uh, filled up a laundry basket with a turkey and all the fixings for Thanksgiving dinner. But you can't stand still in life, and you can't just show that to your children year after year that we just actually sit around and wait for somebody to knock on the door and give us stuff. So I, uh, my father encouraged me to go back to college and I met a, you know, it's funny how God orchestrates things right, right around the same time. There was a girl going to my church, single mother, two children, and she was already enrolled in classes. And I went over to her house and we were talking and, and so I thought, Wow, this is exciting, and I could really do it too. And at the time, I was a part-time bank teller, so I was earning some of my own money. Uh, we were relying on child support. But as I 
watched those days and unfold and it it was you know partly people giving me fish and you know the old adage of if you give a person a fish they eat today and if you teach them how to fish they can eat for a lifetime but it was partly people giving us fish and partly people showing us how to fish and the, the encouragement of you know hey hang in there this has to be hard working having a house and kids and and uh taking on a full full uh schedule a full credit load and uh, my last semester i had 18 credits and i was commuting an hour each way every day so um that was a tough semester but i knew i only had to do it once when i got out i didn't you know of course i didn't exactly have a job waiting for me it was a couple months until i got a job and that's when it really got tough um, you know, people think you're done and it's all over and it's like, yeah, but I still need to get a job. And it, it got very difficult then. And there was this miraculous thing where, you know, we're starting to use up the store. The peanut butter has gone. The hot dogs are gone when you're a single mother. You know, peanut butter used to be cheap. Uh, that's why we collect peanut butter for the food bank now because it's not cheap anymore but it's still a good source of protein it's, it's still a, a source of a good source of food so you know we were really running i was running out of tea bags we were running out of sugar to put in the tea all kinds of just paring down to the basics and it's really getting low and i opened my bible one day and there's the this passage from habakkuk and I'm not even sure if I just opened it by chance or if I was reading a devotional. But the third chapter of Habakkuk contains these verses that say something like, when the stalls are empty, when there's no fruit on the vine, when there's no crop in the field, re- I will rejoice in the Lord. And I thought, okay, the stalls are empty and there's no crop in the field and we don't have anything. And I will, you know, I said, I rejoice anyway, Lord. And kind of went about my day, not expecting anything exciting to happen. And the next day when I got the mail, there were t- two envelopes from Penn State, uh, where I had just recently received my degree. And one was uh, $1,300 left over from my student loan account. I had just gotten this check for $1,300. And I had, by this point in time, established wonderful relationships with several creditors, uh, first name basis. And I was able to satisfy, to a certain degree, every every creditor took the kids out to the grocery store, and everybody got to pick something they wanted, your, your favorite cereal, your favorite candy, something. So that got us through. There was an, the other envelope contained a check for $50, which was actually slightly disappointing after the first one. But that was my deposit on my my application from four years earlier, which of course I'd completely forgotten that they had intended to give me that $50. You usually, usually don't get money back from the university at the end. So, so that was very encouraging. It, shortly thereafter, we had a support hearing and we established monthly support and uh, I got a job that was part-time that eventually turned into full-time and we began to find our feet financially. When we began to not wait for somebody to put a box of food on the front porch anymore. And eventually you get to the point in life where you're wondering if there's somebody you need to put a box of food on their front porch or, you know, get them a grocery gift card or something that, you know, the, that it might, my children will call us up every so often and say, Mom, I heard about this. Do you have, do you have any gift cards? And, you know, so, so that they can help somebody. And they, they, of course, contribute too. But it's, it's just wonderful to watch this heart growing and somebody who knows what it's like to sort through the box of food on the front porch and and then to figure out how to be able to give that to other people. And that's the idea of just not just not standing still in life. One of my favorite stories to tell is the story of uh, the guy who runs the food pantry. He is a retired Marine lieutenant colonel. You imagine the type. And all the veterans out there are going, Oh, I know who that is. I know that kind of person. Well, he's just a great big teddy bear inside with a heart of gold for the needy. And he runs this food pantry. And he told me this story. I love this story because it's a picture of exactly what I'm talking about. There was a young woman who comes to the food pantry with three young children. She is still a teenager. Now, out there, everybody's making that stereotypical uh, assumption, same assumption I made. She keeps having the same problem. No, she was married. She was married to the father of the children. 
they were still teenagers, he couldn't find full-time work because he didn't have his GED. So my friend, the retired Marine Lieutenant Colonel, encourages him, hey, you know the GED program, but what are the chances this guy didn't know that existed? He needed someone to encourage him to pursue this. And he did, and he passed the test, and he got his GED, and then the Marine Colonel calls up the employers and said, hey, I know you've employed this guy part-time. Do you know he has his GED? He passed the test. He did everything he needed to do. Those people don't come to the food pantry anymore. They just needed not the fish for the day, but the fish for the rest of their hairs, how to fish. They are fishing themselves today. And that's what you look for when you're doing a ministry like this. Yes, you want to feed these people today. When you when you go in there to this food pantry, if you go in with a child, you walk out with a whole lot of stuff for that child because he has such a heart for children. But that's that's the idea is to get it to the point where these people don't have to come here anymore and where they can be part of the community, lifting up other people around them. And another little story, there are a, a couple of examples of this in the book. But I took one of my children with me to the bank where I was an employee, uh, not at that branch, though. So I walk in the door. I have one of my children with me. It's the middle of the day because of the schedule was part time. And it's the summertime because the kids weren't in school. And we go in and I ask for my food stamps. And the teller behind the counter had been very, good morning. How may I help you? And as soon as I said food stamps, hmm, hmm. <laughs> I got nasty looks and glares and and curtness and I was getting ready to say something like, do you realize I am a fellow bank employee? Do you realize that I have not chosen this situation for myself? But I looked down at my son and I realized he's not paying attention to her. He doesn't see how she's treating us. And if I call her attention to it, I will call his attention to it. There was another example of this that happened with one of my other sons. We, uh, I uh, gave him food stamps one day. He had been assigned to bring some sort of chips or something to the school party the next day. So I sent, the, for the very first time, he was allowed. All his older brothers and sisters had done this before. And he wanted his chance to go into the store, just like grown-ups do, pick out what he wanted to buy and go check out all by himself. And I allowed him to do that while I sat in the car looking through the glass with the watchful eagle eye on my baby uh, watching him do this. And he just enjoyed the daylights out of it. I could tell and when he got to the counter and he presented his food stamps, I saw that same look in the eye on the clerk. And again, Wanted to go inside and say, hey, not his fault. By the way, he needs this isn't junk food that we're going to go home and watch rented movies or something. We're this is for school tomorrow. He was assigned this. So he sadly, the teacher did not assign him fresh vegetables of which you might approve of him buying with food stamps. But again, my son didn't notice. He's so thrilled with his newfound independence and maturity of being allowed to go into the grocery store. I didn't call it to his attention. But that is when it occurred to me that people using food stamps and on, on assistance of sorts, they get this look all the time. And when you're on there for a while, you're going to look up. You're going to see that. And you're going to think to yourself, maybe I'm not worthy. And then maybe you stay there, you stand still, maybe you don't become independent because you've seen that look in somebody's eye looking at you one too many times. So that I think is, is since you put, if you're put on the other side of the counter, then you have to watch how you're looking at people. If you've been on that, the front side of the counter, you know what that is already. So when we look down on people who are in need, we haven't walked a mile in their shoes. I think that's why a lot of homeless people say homeless veteran. And maybe they, it's very likely that they are, but I wonder if some of them aren't. It, but they get more help and more assistance just by saying, hey, I'm a veteran. 
it's, we actually understand and have heard those stories and we know what some of those guys, at least in our heads, perhaps not but through our own experiences, we, we understand what they've gone through. And we, of course, feel gratitude. But, you know, anybody out on the street, you don't know what they've been through. And just a few, you know, missing a few paychecks for us would put all of us on the street. I, we have to realize. When I first uh, heard you in this other podcast, it I mean, I always had a uh, independent spirit, always believe you got to go out there, go to the next level as much as you can. Um, and for you, it just reinforced what I believed, you know, it feels like I was like the only guy that believed that <laughs> around my area. Um, in your book, you talk a lot about marriage and uh, can tell yeah. us a little bit about that portion of the book. Well, that was, uh, you know, there I was with five children. My baby was seven months old. My oldest had just turned 10 when we found ourselves alone. And three years later, because uh, I wasn't willing to rush into divorce, I, I had honestly, practically speaking, no way to benefit from pursuing that at the time. And I wanted to see if the family could get back together for the sake of the children, even though you're not supposed to talk about that so much anymore. But my husband chose to uh, divorce me and remarry. And the 11 years I spent by myself, I spent at the time, it wasn't a really big thing in churches to have the single, per the single parent Sunday school class. I was, I sat in the married couples class for years because I was married. Once I got divorced, I felt like I didn't have a home. And it was a beautiful thing that happened that there was a college and career class. Well, I'm 30, you know, and everybody in that class is 20 or ish, at least. No, I don't really think I fit there. That's even though I even when I went back to college, I still don't fit there. And this one friend of mine kept inviting me, please just come back to the married class. It's okay. We still love you. Please come back. And finally I did. And that really was worthwhile. I mean, these people had children the ages of my children. And there was there was still a lot in common, even though I was a single person. Shortly thereafter, they started the um single parent divorced person's Sunday school class. And I felt that I had a greater advantage, though, because sometimes and I, I spent my share of time doing this, too, that single people will sit around and talk about how their lives would be better if they were married or how nasty their ex-husband is or, you know, here's the latest thing that happened to me. And you do need some of that. Uh, how Let me share my burden with you. You do need that. But my two best friends were both married. And. The beauty of that was that you know one of my friends, my uh, I call them my best friends, which I understand you know, typically that means one person, but I have two. So one of them uh, was dealing with her husband's chronic illness, and that made her life not very easy, made it very difficult. She became the primary breadwinner for quite a period of time, and uh, for example, when the state of Pennsylvania, she was a state employee, when the state of Pennsylvania does not pass their budget by June thirtieth you don't get paid. In one year, it was six weeks that they went with no paycheck. So just because I was a single mother didn't mean that my life was harder than anybody else's. The other uh, woman, who's my best friend, um, her husband was police officer. And she watched him put on his Kevlar every day and go out and work between 8 p.m. and 4 a.m. and deal with the worst of the things that were happening. And believe me, the worst of the things that were happening in our city at the time. So uh, I do remember also making my wedding dress as I'm approaching uh, remarriage and I put my dress together and I went over to this friend's house and I asked her to pin to pin my hem for me because I knew that she would know how to do it correctly, that it would look right. But I arrived on the evening that she and her husband were having conflict. And as she's sitting there with pins in her mouth, she's saying, are you sure you really want to do this again? So. I've actually thought of that a few times in the ensuing years of, of her warning me, so to speak, because there's that tendency as a single person in a difficult situation to say, here's my way out. And it's really your way into a new set of circumstances that 
might be just as hard, and just as challenging, more challenging in some ways. So, you know, you, especially when you're, I, mean, I was alone for 11 years, I get used to being alone. I got used to making decisions uh, that I didn't have to ask somebody permission or we didn't have to sit down and, and work this out with, you know, we have an extra hundred dollars. What are we going to do with it? And it's like, no, I just decided before. We, so there was a big adjustment in that. And I think having had married friends as opposed to simply surrounding myself with single people really helped me to see that, you know what, life's hard the whole way around and expecting something to come like a magic wand and make everything all better is probably not realistic. And so when you're in that difficulty, then later on, you can say, yep. And that watching them stick through it, one of them, uh, my friend whose husband was chronically ill, they've been married uh, 45 years. So watching people stick it out like that and for better, for worse, in sickness and in health and for richer, or for poorer, because everybody's times go up and down. That really makes a difference. And that's something that, that we need to be showing our children, whether in, I liked that my kids had these places to go and play with other friends where they were seeing a mom and a dad together. So not, you know, not everybody gets to see that. And I think that's, that's crucial that, um, that you put your kids in a position where they get to see other people interacting that way and, you know, working the thing out in the kitchen with what are we going to do today or how are we going to do that? How should we handle this situation? And, and if you spend enough time in somebody else's house, you're going to see that kind of situation and you're going to say, wow, these, these people have something that's not happening at my house, but hmm, there's there's a situation that that becomes reality to them. It's not just something they see on TV that that appears to just be fantasy. If you had to give general advice uh, to a twenty year old and also to a thirty year old, what would, uh, what would you tell them? Wow. So the twenty year old, that's kind of interesting because that person's either in college or getting training or in the workforce already. And I remember when we went to Asia uh, on a trip with a team member, there was a young man there who asked me, he was there uh, working as a teacher. We were teaching English as a second language. He wasn't a career teacher. He was there because he felt he was supposed to be, that God had been leading him to this, knowing it was not his career path. And he came with his girlfriend And he asked me at one point, how do I know she's the one? And I said, oh, that's pretty, that's an easy question for me to answer. Wait two years. I said, in two years, you will either have already broken up or you'll know you can't live without her. And the last time I saw them on social media, they were the happily married parents of two little children and seemed to be doing very well. 30-year-old, that's kind of interesting and because there were dealing perhaps with someone who's finished school and is out into the career, um, perhaps married or contemplating it, uh, perhaps has already has children or contemplating that. So that's that's an interesting place to be. And I would, you know, always, of course, tell people to follow God's leading and and his provision. I would ask, you know, what was really nice for me with was the one friend of mine the, the dressmaker with the pins in her mouth telling me to, to be sure I knew what I was doing. She, uh, one of her, her kids were a little bit ahead of my kids and she had navigated some of the school programs and some of the ways to do things. And she shared this with me. And then so go find that person who's a step ahead of you, just a step ahead of you, whether it's raising children, whether it's already being married, whether it's in your career path, Find that person just a step ahead of you because they'll either know how to do it right or they'll know what to avoid to do it wrong. And somebody was asking me about being, you know, in in that middle age years, you know, what would my advice be? And I said, find somebody who's already in it. If your nest is about to become empty, go find somebody's nest who is empty and ask them how they dealt with it. It, You know, and and always I think it's, it's also crucial to maintain a varied kind of community 
where you you're inviting the single uh, person in if you're a group of married people. Um, sometimes people feel threatened by that. I I remember having a conversation once where I thought some of the men were being rude, and I said, "You guys make me glad I'm not alone. <laughs> you make me glad I am alone." And so. Um, just that sense of seeing the reality of how how people are sometimes and but being part of the group and not as a, a threatening member either just to have the uh the unmarried person in your group to have the married person in your group if you're unmarried uh to have the person that's just a little bit different from you are or as i said earlier a little bit ahead of you perhaps somebody a few steps behind you in life that that so you can receive mentoring but you can give out mentoring. You can receive discipleship and you can give out discipleship. And mentoring is kind of a practical sort of, uh, you know, here's how here's how to do something you haven't ever done before. Here's how to use Skype. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, could have used one of those today. But here's here's how to do the thing you're not familiar with. And then somebody somebody you can say to hey, here's how I can help you do the thing you haven't done yet either. So it's somebody that can give to you, somebody you can give to. I think that's that's a great rule for life no matter what age you are. Are you ready for some random questions? Sure. What would you tell your 15-year-old self? Oh, my God. Well, don't be so stupid. <laughs> <laughs> don't be so stupid. That, and it's funny because I have, I have grandchildren, a 14-year-old, well, almost. She's... She's a little precocious, so we kind of bump her up sometimes a few months. Um, but two 13-year-old granddaughters, and every so often I want to take them aside and say, look, do you know what you're getting yourself into here? <laughs> Here's the way boys think at this age, I tell these girls. And um, so my 15-year-old self, I would say, take it slowly and don't rush. Be wise. And don't we always feel like that sometimes when you get through gotten through a season of life? You say, "Boy, if I had that to do over again, I would have done." Yeah. So, though so that that would be a long conversation, me with my fifteen year old self. What's the worst pet to have? Oh, I would think a snail. <laughs> <laughs> Although a snail can be necessary if you have a fish tank, because the snail will clean the fish tank. The best pet, of course, is a dog. A cat is close behind. I had a cat once that I believed, not believing really in reincarnation, but honestly, this cat had been a dog in a, different, in a previous life and had done something dreadfully wrong. Because typically you don't find a Siamese cat with the personality of a dog. But yes, that is the cat that we had. What's a snail. A snail, yeah. What's something that <laughs> cannot be bought or sold on the internet? Well, cannot be bought or sold on the internet. Gee, well, perhaps true love, although I suppose there's somebody out there who's found it on the on the uh, Internet. But uh, you know, be careful on the Internet. It's a dangerous place to be. Yeah, it can be. You got to be careful. You got to, you know, do your background checks <laughs> just in case. That's right. Exactly. Oh, that was another benefit, by the way. When I started to date my husband, my friend who's married to the police officer, her husband offered to do an NCIC check for me. <laughs> so. Make friends with police officers' wives, and then you can check people out for real, the, serious ways. Yeah, yeah. There's a benefit yeah. to be a friend uh, with a cop. Can you tell us about your book, and uh, where is the best place to buy it? Okay, Restoring the Shattered, Illustrating Christ's Love Through the Church in One Accord, available on Amazon, available uh, through, if you go to my blog, nancyehead.com. Down at the bottom of every blog post, there's a link that takes you to the Barnes & Noble page, and we're on barnesandnoble.com as well. And your website address is nancyehead.com. Nancy Ehead. Nancy Ehead, as my husband would say, head yeah. like the one on your neck. Because so, awesome. everybody always wants you to spell your last name. <laughs> <laughs> and what is the best way to reach you online? Um, you can uh, contact me through my website, or you can uh, contact me at nancyehead at yahoo.com. There you have it. And if you I'm on I'm on Go ahead. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, Pinterest, all of it. Yes, I've added her in all the platforms. She's really accessible if you have any questions. And if you want to know more about the book, you can look at our show notes. Uh, there's an Amazon link that could take you directly. I highly encourage you guys to purchase it. Well, Nancy, I really appreciate you coming on to the Sleon Productions podcast. And I thank you so much for having me. 
Appreciate your time.